When peace came at last to Verdite, through tribulations and combat almighty. Yet what darkness still lies within, the troubled heart and mind of the king. Alexander consigns himself to fate, as young princeling from castle escapes. Ten years later youth raiseth not his sword, using only magic will he seek his reward. It's time to finish the PS1 trilogy. Kingsfield 3 is a massive undertaking. It will require patience and guile. The first two games were tough at times, but neither offered an insurmountable challenge. In a magic-only playthrough, everything could be ruined by a single magic immune enemy. So far we've found none of those. It's cool, really. The approach I've had is to talk about the games themselves, as well as the specifics of the magic-only run. We'll do the same with KF3, because I want to showcase a great game. The difficulties with this one are the game's size and scale, feeling underpowered, and the fact that it takes a while before we can even fight. And a side note, I was confused, and so the country is referred to as Verdite, but I've been calling the magical upgrade stone Verdite. I'll continue like this, Verdite the country, Verdite the stone. Also, I'll be using the Japanese numeration. This is the third game in the series, and I'll refer to it as Kingsfield 3 from now on. I called it number 2 in the title because that's how the game was released in the West. To Verdite then. Nope. Nope. Oh, come on. We begin our journey in the village our intrepid young hero, Lyle, has been exiled to. Quist. He lived in this house with Leon from Kingsfield 2. Remember that painting? I'm sure you do. I know what you're saying. Blinge, what's the deal with Quist? You know, what are the attractions? What are the amenities? Well, there's the statue of the hero, a visit to the local store, where the shopkeeper says she'll be dead soon anyway. How about the accommodation? Well, here's the inn. Rustic. Dare I say charming. Two bed capacity in, in the same room. The innkeeper has apparently known us since we were a child and still tries to charge 150 gold to stay in this shitty room. That's more gold than you start with. How dare. Quist serves as our safe little baby ninja starting area for Kingsfield 3. We're actually locked in and need a key to leave. Contrast this with the more open-ended beginning of 2. And I can't resist saying, this is the first Kingsfield to feature... a field. Normal progression involves simply killing enemies, I suppose, until one, this plant near Leon's house, drops the key we need. However, a significant early challenge is that we don't have any spells. None. And we don't get one for some time. So this plant friend remains alive, and we'll have to find a key somewhere else. This is where I love Kingsfield. Yes, there's another key which we can get without fighting. Exploration reveals a side area with a trench guarded by a deadly mushroom. We can sprint up the slope and check out this little shack. Our key is in this chest, with a classic skeleton surprise. Standing to the side ensures his slash will miss, and we can quickly escape through the door. It's a bit nerve-wracking, as that slash will kill us at this level. Before we leave, we grab some healing grasses, steal antidotes from the mush booms, and why is a regular herb in this wooden chest? They're scattered all over the floor nearby. North of Quist, we use our Silviera key to enter the battleground. This is where the brave men of Verdite died fighting the demon legions that spewed from the castle. And there it is. You gotta love that foreshadowing. Up there is Verdite Castle, the final destination of this game. In the distance, out of reach. You'd think the last of civilization has been left behind us, but the first thing we find here is a house. Let me just peep through the window first, like a creeper. It's an old woman. It's one Marilyn Miller, no less. Hmm. She wants us to find her son. He's in danger, she says. He needs the amulet to be free. 
Not safe, not brought back. He needs it to be free. Is he captive somewhere? Remember who made this game. How do you think her son is doing? Okay, what have we got? Poisonous mushroom? A chest. Bones in a box. At least they're not moving this time. Are you the old lady's son? No, you're a gravedigger. It's steady work. In this country. He's another merchant. Nothing we can buy yet, though. Warns us about grave pots? What? Let's go. I'm level one, no experience, made of paper. I really don't want to take hits. Oh, the tree enemies from KF1 return, and they look a bit meaner. A real danger here is being poisoned. These evil bell sprouts spit poison at long range, and I don't have many antidotes. You can see how safe I'm playing, hugging the walls and keeping my distance, waiting until they're turned the other way to make my move, hoping they don't shoot me in the back as I wait for doors to open. Found the gravedigger's house. I'll... I'll just take this key. This foreboding room is our goal. So we grab the Kokiri shield and head in. An unnatural darkness pervades, dangerous skeletons and nine invisible ghosts. A body is stuck on the door with the bones picked clean. It's the old lady's son. This is what she meant when she asked us to free him. We use the charm and he finally departs this mortal coil. The darkness is now lifted, and it's slightly easier to see the ghosts. And I got hit in the back, and cursed. Curse is an attack debuff, but that's fine. I won't be attacking for a while. It's time to meet Mr. Noodles, the fire mage who finally, finally gives us our first magic spell. The ultimate goal of Kingsfield 3 is to meet and learn four elements from four mages. That was our first one done. Still playing it very safe, having to inch past these enemies like an inch boy. I've been lost in here more times than I'll admit. There's a shortcut here that lets you skip straight from Marilyn to the next area, but I'm missing a key. Ugh, I have to backtrack. We turn the quest in with the old dear, and she gives us a map of Vedite. Thanks, I'll use it in my video. I decide at this point to go get another Silviera key from an enemy I know drops one, back at the beginning of the game. Through here, and ugh, you're so in the way. There's the key, but look at the recharge time even on this basic fireball. Oh no. Oh god, that's gonna... Ugh. With the busy work done, it's time to head underground. Underneath the battleground is the garrison. It's an underground bunker for the embattled soldiers of Verdite. Now it's staffed by more of a skeleton crew. I noticed here that the NPCs in this game are more interesting, or better written. The commander is the only man left down here, and has survivor's guilt. He wishes he'd died from his wounds. Man. In another game, you might be able to help him move on. This might be a side quest or something. Not much to do here now, but run from skeletons and escape to a nicer place. Above ground reminds me of the shaded woods from Dark Souls 2, where everything has the same texture. It's another harpist playing at a wall. Now that's how you know he's depressed. Who sits in a corner and plays directly into a wall? It turns out our father had some clarity before he went mad, and gave this wimp some enchanted thingamy to pass on to us. Yet he's been robbed by a fairy. Come on, man. The idea here is that you navigate this hedge maze, the Forest of Vard, to hunt down that fairy and the trickster, Vard himself. But we've got other priorities. We still have no source of magic. What I know is there's an MP source in Relugo. I figured it's probably easier to head there without fighting anything and save MP for an emergency. Maybe there's an enemy that completely blocks our path. 
If the battleground seemed a bit maze-like, well this place is literally a maze, with simple switch puzzles throughout. What devilry is this? Eventually we find the door to Relugo and can head into the village. Wow! Uh, this place seems nice. Relugo will become our home base for this playthrough. Relugo? Relugo? Ralugo? It's a big place and easy to get lost. A smart man would follow the dirt pathways, but let it never be said that I am a smart man. Things to see. A statue of Dada, John Alfred Forrester from the first game, and the current Mad King. But this is not what we're really here for. The MP fountain. That coveted golden shower. Ah, drink deep. Now we have a source of magic, and we had to skip exploring or fighting anything in the first four areas of the game to do it. We're woefully underpowered as a result, so it's time to celebrate our arrival by level grinding, really slowly. Look at that recharge. It will get faster, but not for a while. Check out my 360 no-scope. I got about four or five levels in this manner, and I'm not gonna lie, it sucked. And while I was sniping this spider through the trees, I started to get creeped out. The horrendously slow, tortured movements from the purple arachnid. The awkward looking animations made me think its very existence is tortured, that its movements are painful. The glaring red eyes desperate for a meal fighting for the last scraps of nourishment in a dying world. The sound of running water in the background used to be comforting. The forceful cough as it breathes poison at me. The agonized scream as it finally dies. Was that fear or perhaps relief? Let's meet the other residents. There's Bad Joke Priest. Here we go. What do you call a cross between a banana and a gymnast? A banana split? Teehee question mark? There's the Fat Man of Kingsfield 3. He's eating well to stay strong for when the captain returns, which he won't. And I suspect Mr. Porter knows that. Ha! <laughs> More like Mr. Portly. I'll be here all night. With... with the priest. There's Lynn, our childhood friend and potential love interest, believe it or not. Hey, I know you. There's Janin and her diseased child. Even with these basic graphics, he really looks rough. It's part of our royal duties as a prince, you know. Our beleaguered subjects need help. To cure the boy, we need the red herb, found past this horrendous cliff that will slide you off into the lava if you don't strafe hard into the wall. There we go. Arachnophobes, look away now. I'm getting all up in them legs. We avoid most enemies and grab the red herb. We then return and give it to the mother. In return, she hands us a wind crystal, which is the first increase to wind magic we've had. At this point, I have the same problem that plagued my other magic-only runs, and obviously solving this problem is part of the fun! We have the Golden Fountain, but we need Esty Boys. We need a flask to take some MP Restore with us. This time, I've spoken to speedrunners Imject and Rypitrowski, and got some advice. I'll link their channels in the description. They told me of a crystal flask right beneath my nose. This series has some hidden items you can interact with. They're invisible on the floor. This one is just laying on the grass in Relgo and will be a massive help as is another one back in the Light Family tomb in Quist. A hidden door, the bone zone, and a second crystal flask. Previously we rushed through the maze to reach the safe haven of Ralugo. I have since discovered this was totally unnecessary. We were supposed to find Vard in his forest and retrieve special MacGuffins, and it turned out to be way easier than I thought. It took two minutes. Just avoid all the enemies, twist some woods, and here's Vard. Remember when he sent a fairy to steal from the pathetic heart man some years ago? Well, that was because he wanted to talk to us. Okay, I guess. 
It gives us the key of Icreus, which will warp us back to the fountain, and also the Pixie's map, which writes itself as we progress. Before we leave the maze, there's one last boon. We find a light crystal, which increases our magic, of the light element only. Which leads us to our next problem. How to effectively level up the various elements. Now for the technical stuff. Every time we level up, we get more points in our magic stats. This is in addition to the increase that happens when using that particular element. The only problem is, it only starts giving you points in an element when you've gone above zero. Every element except light begins at zero until you find a way to raise it, or learn that element. We have fire, light and wind, but leveling up gives me nothing in water and earth. I want to get more out of my levels. Magic damage is obviously really important for me. The quickest way to get everything above zero is to find a verdite stone. Luckily, there's one in Shaddam's cave, which is one of our destinations anyway. The fat man has put a plank across the lava flow at considerable personal risk. So here we are, the caves of the earth mage, Shudom. It pains me to run past these enemies. I'm no speedrunner. I want to slowly plink them all to death with my weak fireballs and become strong. But no such luxury. I spend some 20 minutes running around here looking for the verdite, squeezing sideways sliding past skellies on worrisome walkways. This stone face is called Garth? Okay, what hit me there? So, while running around like a headless chicken, I actually found the Earth Mage, who was my next destination anyway. So, Earth Magic is learned. That's a heal spell, which I don't have much use for now. I came across the Cave of the Giants and spoke to their last sad skeleton. Eventually, I discovered the Verdite. And boom, every magic has now begun. They'll all grow in power from now on. The gloves are off and I can fight. I decided to brawl with this skeletal scimitar slasher instead of firing from a distance, and boy did I regret it. He covers a surprising amount of distance with his lunge. ran around, nope the hell away from this boss looking golem, and it's time to leave. Let's go back to earlier areas now that we're able to kill everything, and see what we can find. Back at the old garrison, we find Undead Born, the prequel to Bloodborne I guess? Shut up. Training our fire magic earns us the firewall spell, a FromSoft classic at this point. I hope it becomes more cost effective to use. After a decent amount of time exploring, I killed an enemy that dropped a copper key. I could have done this hours ago and been able to open chests all over the game. Just look at this description. This is the master key for most of the treasure chests. Most of the time the key opens the treasure chests. That was, that was hard to read. I swept the whole garrison, again, went to jail and got slashed up by some swinging blades. What is this? Sends, I mean, night fever? Yeah. Back to our main quest. Meet the four elemental masters. We've met fire and earth, now let's track down wind. One turning off the woodland maze leads us to a hidden palace, guarded by a one John Creel. Old John Boy won't let us in without knowing a thing or two about wind magic. We satisfied this condition by picking up the wind crystal in Ralugo some time ago. Before we go in, let's check what the truth glass says about him. His one wish was to have a puppy, but King Harvine wouldn't let him. <laughs> I really don't know what you're going for here, Kingsfield. What's with the tonal shift? Also, Harvine's been dead for 300 years. I'm sure Johnny Boy could get a puppy if he wants one now. As for why John's apparently still alive, I have no idea. Funky design in this place. So it's green, because green is the colour of wind spells in this series, I presume. But wind doesn't actually have colour in... in IRL, and it's all underground. 
Surely a wind-themed palace would be out in the open with plenty of airflow. The monsters here are tough as nails. They won't let me in, and my fireballs have little effect. This palace has a series of torches that, once lit, will unlock all the chests within. I figured I could rush through, light all the torches, find the wind magic teacher, and loot the place without having to fight these tough enemies. I hit a roadblock, however. This salamander throws fire at me. I can't squeeze past and nearly die. I didn't even try to use fire on him. I went looking for that wind spell to hit him with instead. So up these stairs lies my prize. I just have to get past these stone faces, magical turrets, who destroy me. Their spells have good enough homing to 180 and hit me in the arse. What's more, they do it twice. This time I run to the right so I only get hit by one fireball instead of both. I thought I'd dodged it, but it followed me all the way down the stairs. Oh well, we're here. Time to learn some wind magic. You now have control of great power. Boy, she wasn't kidding. First up, it's my trusty wind cutter, the old faithful. Time to renovate the walls. This scythe skelly hits me with paralyze and dark, but I can still throw fire at him. Time to work my way back through. Pissed me, missed me. Now you gotta kiss me. I'd assumed the crooked demons are somehow wind aligned and that wind cutter might not be good against them. I'm happy to say I was wrong. They go down in just two hits. I since realised that it's the effect of the Wind Palace. I think it actually doubles my Wind Magic stat. 83 is very high for the early game. It's good to start feeling powerful after all my struggles. And the last torch is lit. With a resounding click, all the chests open. The first thing I pick up are the Fujin boots. These things are awesome. Wearing these things means my magic gauge starts to refill instantly as soon as I stop running, whereas before there was a delay. Now I get to pew pew quicker. Now we retread the entire palace to pick up all the goodies. I don't mind, I'm enjoying the easy XP. We get... Birdite, Wind Crystal, Dragon Fruit. We're now one-shotting the demons. Another DTF. Wind Magic Up, Wind Crystal, Wind Necklace, The Wind Rises by Hayao Miyazaki. And we're out of here with hella swag. Remember we had to leave the Earth Magic Cave earlier, for min-maxing purposes. Well now we're back to clear out the place, grab the loot, and carry out some very dry wet work. The skeletal giant asked us to rid these halls of the golems. That involves taking on these tag teams. Look at their sliding tackle. Oh man, I'm getting rocked out here. This is the loop now. We go in, take on durable duos, run out of gold potions, warp out, repeat. Yeah, how do you like me now? Oh no, that's puss plays. Let's get down there. This must be the boss, the Promius Golem. He's made of smithing material and drops it on death. He's, he's a titanite demon. <laughs> Dark Souls ripoff, am I right, guys? It recharges slowly, but I opted for Firewall because it's bigger. Our work is done. The skeleton lifts the boulder for us. <laughs> That's so unnecessary, he could have just like, rolled it off. Drops it, and we can pay our respects at Shaddam's tomb by taking his stuff. The Magician's Key, bro! That unlocks magic-y chests all over the place. Oh, and some ring. We're too dumb in game to understand what it does. Immediately, the key pays off. These Magician chests often contain magic ups across the board. It's all damage in the end. Right, time to progress to get- oh, fuck. I hit Lin with Firewall. She seems to be okay. Well, I sold stuff to buy a silver ring for poison resist because we're heading to... We're going down a blight town. Here's Joe Santos. 
The game says he's crazy. He says the god Valad has hidden a key for him in this tunnel. Kingsfield, or its translation, has some weird humour here. He used to think he was a glass of orange juice. Yep. But he wasn't talking crazy, the key is here. He's correct. Anyway, we take it, and head into the path of poison. We're immediately afflicted, but the ring will make it wear off quicker. The first chest is, of course, also full of poison. I somehow miss another silver ring in this large room, which would have made us completely immune. I think it's on a corpse, somewhere. These burning statues indicate a hidden door, which is necessary to proceed. That silver key we grabbed unlocks the secret stash of the Light family, Fedati's merchants. 300 gold in one chest, 20 in another. That's weird. This one flask makes it worth it. Who's this? Lady Face, Spider Body, Booba, uses fire attacks. Ah, uh, no idea. Alchemine's homing projectiles do big damage. We have to sprint to avoid it and hope it hits the wall. But sprinting empties our focus meter so we can't retaliate quickly enough. I found the safe time to attack is when she throws out a normal fireball instead of a homing one. She took some killing. She serves as the boss of this area, and the bane of speedrunners. Our prize? The Aquarian Boots. Let us leave this foul place. The young prince, that's us, emerges at Lake Noel, our mother's namesake. It's about the closest Kingsfield 3 gets to pretty. Speaking of which, nearby waits the Water Mage, the last magic teacher. I like her. Whatever she's wearing looks like stars. This is where we need those Aquarian boots. Magical bridges appear once we don them. The puzzle element to this place, though, is that we need to ply the Lady of the Lake with gifts, so she opens a door for us, revealing a wheel and a small map of the islands. The blue lines represent the bridges, and upon turning the wheel they change, giving us access to different islands. There's also a merchant outside who can help with... Pfft, dwarfs? I think you mean dwarves, mate. Well, there's your English lesson for today. That'll be 20 pounds, please. Okay, let's see what these tree monsters are made of. Other than wood. I love this animation. That's an overhand right. Okay, hiding behind the lamp, using coward tactics. Ah, he hit me into the water. We can't swim. Ugh, let's reload. I died again! That knocked me back so far! Third try. My new firestorm spell one-shots the tree men. Eventually, turning the wheel grants access to the opposite shore. There's ruins here. Ostensibly a settlement destroyed by Monstars. After some pest control, we find one of them is friendly. Not even the translators found his lines, apparently. And he gives us a gold ring. His name's Mel Morris. I... I don't... Just read it if you want. Yeah. The final turn of the water wheel gives us access to our magic teacher, who'd been testing us with this simple puzzle all along. I can't figure out if all these mages are actually dead. They seem to linger in this world for one purpose. To teach me... Well, our business in Lake Noel is concluded. It's time to move on. Well, almost. Sorry, Mel. I'm gonna need your flask. Our next destination is the Path of Thieves. It is classic dungeon crawler action. We've got trap chests. We got pendulums. Ow. We got spike pits. As usual, we loot the whole place. I want every piece of verdite I can get. Gimme. 
Oh, oh, ba oh, baby, you the double? We encounter a mid-boss. A boneman who summons more bonelings. Sadly, the AI is confined to this room, it seems, and I'm not about to walk into a wall of swords, so I lame it out. Yeah. Wind crystal and hidden verdite. Alright, alright. I find another one for round two and realise getting hit drains my precious MP. I can't take many of those hits. What the hell, man? I found all the Chaos Emeralds at once, and they hurt. We find our way to the puppets, and they're resistant to pretty much any spell we throw at them. I use the special Joseph Joestar technique, and just run. There's a running theme with many areas in this game. It involves fighting through, finishing the area, and unlocking shortcuts that allow for easy traversal upon your return. This was by design because it happens in areas that you want to revisit and explore alternate paths from. It happened in the ancient battleground with the Silviera Keys, in the maze with the tree blockades disappearing after you meet Vard, and deactivating traps slash opening doors in this area allows us to quickly access the four exits. The first such exit we try takes us to the village. We emerge to a red sky once again. Casson Village is a cursed place, home to a young girl tending to her crops, all alone. With how terrible Verdite has become, it's a wonder anything still grows. On my first playthrough years ago, I found Casson's atmosphere to be crushing. The music. The darkness. The abundance of nearly invisible ghosts that inflict curse status and the fact that two sisters have been here for god knows how long, eking out an existence just across the river from this grim ghost town. I've been cursed from behind, which makes our spell recharge longer, and all attacks do less damage. I can't even one-shot this log stalker anymore, and consider just throwing myself into the well. This place is so grim, man. What is this thin building with just one wooden bench inside? Looks like something I'd build in Valheim. Some ghosties hide inside buildings as well. You have to kick the door down and throw spells immediately. I get paranoid at this point. I keep thinking I've seen another ghostly sprite in the corner of my eye. It costs bloodstones or gold potions to remove curse or darkness. If you aren't careful, you could find yourself drained of resources. A petrified Lord Vayrak stares out from his window, watching the village fall to rack and ruin, unable to move. The search for the other sister continues. At the end of a long corridor we're darked again, but can cast the light spell to compensate. Tony Gomez is one of the first characters to show any kind of respect to Lyle, calling him My Prince. It's understandable considering what the King's been up to. She gives us Orladin's pick, the needle we need to unpetrify Vayrak. Just like that. He's a useful chap, Vayrak. The wings of Icrius he gives us are the second warp item, which send us to the end of Casson, sparing us the most annoying ghost house and straight to another golden fountain. Progress is blocked, however, by a petrified plant. Tony will give us another pick, but instead of walking to her, we warp away from Casson and have a nap in Ralago. The innkeep gives outdated advice about Harvine, King of Wind. He means wind magic, but unfortunately, I can't hear wind here as anything else than a polite term for the release of noxious gases from someone's anus. Sorry to lower the tone there. Anyway, we have strange prophetic dreams. Reloading Casson means that helpful chap Vayrak now protects the village and has slaughtered every remaining baddie. He also lights the whole place up. Not sure how he did that. He can also teach us to use sword magic, but we need all elements to be at 50 points, and our light magic lags behind. We scour the place unhindered and find the Gomez sisters reunited. Tony gives us another pick, allowing us to clear the blockage and move on. From Casson, we enter one of my favorite areas. Again, it's an atmosphere thing. The Field of Ice. 
These enemies ain't shit, but I try out the flame spell and set my burn on them. I noticed for the first time here that as well as exploding, it shoots streams of fireballs first. I want it to do a flyby shooting, but cook myself in the process. The snow reminds me of the times it snows in southern England and never settles properly. A disappointment, man. Inside this house we find the fire lit, and Lynn, our elven love interest, who gives us the key to her heart. <laughs> Maybe we could even... I need to clear my head, so we walk out to the cliffs. Do not look. Don't tell me what to do. I'm jumping. I'll fucking do it. Good thing we healed immediately because the fall almost killed us and the enemy tried to finish us off. There's a shipwreck here, and inside, the body of Nora from the previous game. So she tried to sail back from Melanat Island, but she's a FromSoft NPC, so of course, she didn't make it. We warp out, check Lynn's house, grab stuff we'll never use, and head back to the ice field to find it infested with Garan lizards. What's happened here? These guys just laugh at my spells, cast their own tornadoes, and throw one right up my ass. This time, we take it to the lizards, and painstakingly wipe them all out. We have to get to Lynn, you see, check if she's alright. Alas, she's gone. Gone to Garan, to look for her father in the land of the lizards. This conspicuous rock is the path to Garan, and Lynn's been kind enough to leave the switch visible to us. But you've seen how resistant to magic those guys are. We need something that will give us an edge. Or rather, three of them. The Passage of Death. This is an infamous area. You know how in any game now, if there's swinging pendulums or traps, idiots like me will say, Oh, Sen's Fortress! Well this time, it actually is the progenitor to Sen's Fortress the House of a Thousand Traps. It's so dangerous that it can be skipped entirely if you go to Garan first and find Icrius's crown. Don't want to go left, unless you want to be cut like a pizza. And progression requires opening hidden walls. Lots of them. They're all over the place. In the first room I get hit from the side by a spear I didn't know was there. I love it. This place just screams classic dungeon crawler. Tricks, traps, glitter in gold, trinkets and baubles. Paid for in frustration. Those spiky balls stop us getting anywhere, so the aim is to find hidden ways and eventually turn them off. We're here for the royal key, but even with a map it's still tough to figure out where to go, much less get there. And blocking our path. The return of the condom ghosts. Oh no, it's God's punishment for wasted seed. There's another switch thrown, and holy shit, that almost had my eye out. Near the end of the passage, on the Verdaiti castle side, we encounter a rocking chair. What's it doing here? If we consider the description of this area, the king set this place up to hide royal treasures, only to send people in to retrieve them. Was this chair where he sat? in some sick game, watching his hapless subjects die in here. Skewered, squashed, sliced, slaughtered. Just like me. We were almost there, but we got shafted. I didn't think that one spear would hit me twice. I grit my teeth, load my save, and finally we get the royal key. It's defended by the spirit of one who died, but was prevented from dying. Okay. That was a burning hot encounter, if brief. We grabbed a couple more things, warped out, and ran back to the very first area to claim our prize. The Triple Fang. The same sword that John Alfred Forrester, now the evil king, found back in Kingsfield 1. 
but for me, I want it for the same reason. I want the MP regen. We even sell all the fancy armor and weapons we've picked up for the past some 10 hours of gameplay, all to buy more flasks for more MP. I feel like I can never have enough. Now we're packing some serious heat, it's back to the ice field and into the land of Garan. A place so rich in precious metals that the dwarves used to mine here until they all got eaten by lizardmen. That's my front stuff, all right. Let's see if we can track down our lady, Lin. Undodgeable earth waves. At least I can kill these guys. The lizards take three firestorms to kill. That's 45 MP per lizard. I tried some spells from other elements, but either their resistance is too good, or my fire level is so high that other elements can't compete. Now and then we encounter a turtle who blocks the way and can't be hit from the back. They're predecessors to the bear bugs from Demon Souls. Hey, Demon Souls, that's current, right? No, I guess we're on Elden Ring now. But Blinge, why do you fight all the enemies? You can just run through. Well, all right. Oh, when these guys double up, they're a real problem. Remember this guy? This is him now. Do you feel old yet? The slog continues until we spy something grey in the distance. It's Lin. Or as the game likes to convey with the subtlety of a sledgehammer to the nose, the dead body of Lin. They killed her! They fucking killed my dark elf tomboy merchant childhood friend and waifu! Can't have shit in my night. Fuck this man! This is some fucking bullshit! Are these the bastards that did it? One of them drops her prize, the reason we both came here. The Crown of Icrius, our third warp item. They're not MacGuffins if they serve a gameplay purpose, and this certainly does. We have all three pieces of Exo- I mean the Icrius key. We have to give these precious warp items to Leon, back at the beginning of the game again. And now we wait. Time for a nap, I think. And this old penny pincher still charges me. We need to leave Quist, or sleep three times, and talk to Leon every time to make his work progress. Don't do what I did and forget to talk to him each time. Returning on the third day finds Leon gone, with a cryptic message and the completed key. I think Leon put his life force into it. Our hero seems to have lost everyone. Well I'm grateful to the old elf, we can now warp to any fountain in the world. Remember that ornate door in the Path of Poison? No, me neither. Anyway, a dwarf sells a key, so we grab a couple and head back there. Slot it in, and the lock just disappears, huh? You see, we almost have 50 levels for each magic type, which is enough to learn sword magic. The only thing missing is the light element, for which crystals can be found here, in Orladin's palace. The wall textures in this place weird me out a bit, is it supposed to be marble? It looks like cheese gone horribly wrong. Well, this corridor's not so bad. Nice statues in the wall. Oh god, what is that? It's just swinging back and forth, casting darkness at me. What a troll. And sometimes my spells miss. If in doubt, start throwing rocks. Oh no. Oh, oh yes, it's Quellag twins. And now Mytha the Baneful Queen shows up? Alright. Man, she does not give a shit. I found an absolutely savage room. These golems have high defense, hit me with darkness, and also cast slow on me. There's no point in trying to cure these status ailments, because I'm getting hit by three golems at once. And now a fourth. The slow onward march, pestilence, and death. In the pitch black, we find a spell that works and wear them down.
Our prize is the light crystal we needed. Helpful Vayrak now teaches us level 1 sword magic. More on that later. I had to grab it, you know, before he dies. God knows what the trigger for his death is. You think you know, but you don't. Trust me, you don't. Neither does Game Facts, alright? Just, it's a whole other thing. It's time to head towards the end game. Using Icarus Key, we warp to the Hill of Prayer, where the last protagonist was buried. It's another massive graveyard. What is this, Flanders? It's full of ghosts, can you believe it? I'm fed up with looking for them at this point, so it's time to bring out Mozilla Firebird. It shoots ghosts I can't see from a distance before exploding. Brilliant. With this carpet bombing approach, I can make it to this weird church uncursed and meet the best name in the game. Yvette Bintz. This is most likely lost on you, and all but a few viewers, but if you're English like me, you'll know that Bint is an unflattering term for a woman. So when I see this fine lady and her name, I think of Bintz, plural. Alright, it's Yvette Bintz. The game isn't nice to her either. Using the truth glass to get lore on her reveals a strange tonal shift. Usually it gives information about characters, but for her it moves into advice? Listen to her sub story. Feign interest? My god, her husband got trapped in a castle full of evil creatures and a mad king for a decade, and we're the prince fighting for our subjects. I think we'd listen to her story with interest, wouldn't we? The only clue she gives is that she hid a key somewhere in the graveyard. Behind the fountain is a side path to her grave. Oh, well maybe she's forward thinking. No, she's gone. But then who was Bintz? We bomb our way across the fields to reach Alexander's grave. The seal is broken because we learned all four magics. And we get the Moonlight Sword, which is broken. With the seal finally broken, we can go see the castle, say hello to Dad. Big loading squeeze, and we're here. Nice place. Of course, it wouldn't be complete without another bloody grave. This one's for... Oh. This one's for us. When Lynn was alive, she mentioned walking the gardens and the fountain with Alexander, the hero from the last game. So we use her ring on the fountain, and there he is. Is he a redhead? You know, Japanese games have the balls to have redheaded male protagonists. When is the West gonna catch up? Hmm? He teaches us level 2 sword magic. Here it is. The triple fang now acts as a magic wand to fire a triple blast, and I don't know how useful it is. At last, it's time to enter the castle and see what has become of our father. It may look drab to you, but man, when I first got here, I was thinking, oh my god, this is f epic. Finally in Verdite Castle after three games. And this music, man. Out my way, bitches. Alright, that's one key that Boots gave us. We need to find another one. It's the final area, so there's gonna be some tough customers. Like this Zelda 2 dude, who resists all my magic. That's going to be a running theme. Our search takes us downstairs. You know the drill. We kill and steal stuff. What is that horrible red thing? Time to give him the deck. The ultimate fire spell. Oh well that sucked. That's my problem with a lot of the ultimate spells in this game. They don't do much. Come on man, I've played for a long time using just magic at this point. Where's my payoff? Oh hello Dark Souls 2, how you doing? So there's some castle dungeons in this castle dungeon, and one of the cells has a somewhat suspect decor. We walk through the illusory wall and find the basement dweller himself. It's Yvette Bintz's husband. Again with the tonal shifts. Oh yeah. Oh yeah? Like who is who is talking? Anyway, this guy's been living off rats and mouldy bread for a decade. I can understand the rats, but the bread? 
Surely after ten years that will be more mould than bread. Surely there'd be nothing left. Oh well, he's gonna escape now. You know he's fucked as soon as he moves. But there's a terrible noise coming from the walls directly next to him. We investigate. It's another one of those creepy red demons. And I'm about to catch these hands. I don't think Sal realises how close he was to being... consumed. With the second key in hand, we can enter the ground floor proper. This is the real meat of the final area. Off to the right, another double locked door. Okay, we need to find the keys again. I'm back in touch with my wind element these days, and about to meet my late game headache. His creator is called the Dragon of Fire. Original. The battles with these things are grueling. I eventually opt to use Tornado and line them up for double hits where I can. We found Sal's buddy Ent, who is, you guessed it, dead. But at least we get a key. Even my airstrike phoenix doesn't work great, although in RPGs I should know better than to fight fire with fire. The dragon duo dropped the door key. These golden Drago masters are tough as hell. Fortunately, when there's two of them, they tend to hit each other, doing half our work for us. Who builds battlements inside a castle? We take out the horse guards and proceed upstairs. The welcome committee, three headless knights. We give them some fire support. What? It just fucked off. Where's the explosion? Ugh. Fine, it's tornado time, and get my goddamn save point. I forget the name for this guy, so I just call him the Big Knight. That's a FromSoft boss name, isn't it? Big Knight? This guy hits hard. Alas, I die, I die. Twice, actually. We declare Big Knight the winner and just run past. Elsewhere on this floor we find a long staircase down to the hidden treasury. There's another big knight in here whom we have to take out so we can loot. This battle in the treasury was tough. Two big knights and a little one. We use pillars for cover, trying to get the knights to hit each other. And eventually one via attrition. Maybe it's worth it, getting magic crystals and verdite before the final boss. Speaking of which, it's time. Saturday morning cartoon villain. Ah ah ah, now you will die. This is botched translation. Let's see the tone of the original Japanese. A mortal person. Despite being a human being, I praise the foolishness that stands in front of me. Be the servant of the dead king. That's more like it. And with that, we fight. Except we don't. The king is invisible. This confused me so much, I thought, am I missing something? Some kind of item? No, it's a bug. Oops. The truth glass says we're in Seath space. Well, never mind that, we reset. There he is, Gene Alfred Forrester, hero of Kingsfield 1, Swordmaster, and King of Verite. And an evil bastard now. Tough one too, but he's no Necron. I can actually dodge his projectiles which makes this a straight up circle strafe and shoot till it dies. I have no idea what the best spell to use is, there's no way to tell. I mostly opted for the triple fang sword magic. I even forgot there was a level 2 variant of it. This dance of death continues until one of us falls, namely the king. The banner burns and I'll let the game speak for itself. Prince Lyle had fulfilled his destiny, or so he thought. After the destruction of the former Holy King, 
Austin Lyle Forrester succeeded his father to the throne of Verdite and was crowned as the new king. The people were once again happy, and Lyle had the promise to be the greatest king that Verdite had ever known. However, Lyle's eyes were lacking in vitality, and his stare was cold. It is just as it was when the former king had changed. So dramatically. Boom! Roll credits. We got the bad ending. The kings of Verdite are still in thrall to something. There's more to this story. Mysteries unsolved, so let's get to it. Back in the Path of Thieves, there was an exit we never explored. This one leads to the higher elven ruins, and ruins is right. There's basically nothing here, just some heavy atmosphere and cliffs. It's the Valley of the Edge. I like the use of void and different elevations. Picking our way along the cliffs, we come across a house and a scholar. He serves to give hints about Icrius, to tell us this place is important. So a player may find this place halfway through the game, but you can't proceed until you have the full warping ability. Warping to these self-same ruins takes us to a different part, and we immediately find another Orladin key. That's a sign we're getting close. Of course, we can still be distracted and jump gaps for chests. A bunch of rocky rascals are guarding this large plinth. It has an interesting shaped hole in it. Hole? I'm having a mental block here. Is that really the best I can do? Cool, there's a funny hole in this rock. We place the key and it fits just right. These stone archways activate and importantly, we can take the key back out and they remain active. Let's step in. Cool. The archways act as little warp gates, but fortunately they work both ways, so this isn't a real teleporter maze. Eventually we come to an island with a sigil in a little cave. The first thing I do if I see a pattern on the floor in real life is step on it, don't you? Here we are, the maze temple of Orladin. He spent most of his life here and no one knows why. It better be a nice place. Also I'm sure we found another palace of his somewhere else. So what was that? A holiday home? This is a large dungeon, and in the northwest we find more of these bloody one-use key doors and chests. Luckily, keys are in plentiful supply in Orladin's gas. We've got more skull swings and stone faces. Basically, everything magic-themed is in this place. A table and chairs is the only sign that someone ever lived here. It's Thedek's room! This all makes sense to a Kingsfield nerd, so Orladin was the master wizard who trained Thedek the fire chad and Shudom the earth virgin. Got it. These stone faces are too far away for me to kissy kiss, but were apparently designed by Garnabus. Who? What the hell man, Garnabus has not been mentioned anywhere. Fuck off with that. Garnabus. We also found Shudom's room. It's Garth again. We gob rocks at a face gobbing rocks. I have to show you these guys. Just through this door. Ah! Rude. Turns out you don't have to get close to hit them. There's a lot of magic loot here. I wish I'd come here before and not done the bad end first. Because I'm going to have much more power when I'm done here. Or Ladin's hood lets me cast faster. That's a game changer. Look how fast I can throw lightning bolts out. Sorry, doll. With the exploring done, we use this warp tile and proceed to the beginning. Inside these minty green halls, we'll find our answers. We'll also find Cranel. What a name for an enemy. Apparently, they're so resistant to magic that we must use a weapon to beat them. Well, they don't seem that tough. In a room full of pew pew needle faces, just north of the entrance, we find the fairy fossil. That's interesting, because that's the only item we actually need from here for the good ending. But we'll keep exploring. Let's go, Earth Wave. We find Orladin Key Hell, a corridor full of doors and chests that all require these bloody keys. No one needs to see that. 
Eventually we reach caves, and finally this room. I love how the music changes here, leaving us to ponder over this huge door, something which was never meant to be seen. Also, there's a casual skeleton in a chair. Nothing to be done here, so we move on. Punji pits and rickety wooden bridges don't really fit the magical palace aesthetic, but whatever. Deeper we delve, and find lava rivers spewed out by another stone face. A nasty setup. We have to kill the face, otherwise the little quilag will keep respawning in the lava. This ordeal ends with one more nasty room. The final challenge. Thanks to fire resistance, we don't need to worry about the quelags and can focus on the lava vom. We help the enemies with some assisted explosion and obtain our prize. It's a skull. I mean, we've seen a few of them before. Oh no, this one is the demon key. As luck would have it, I know of a certain skeleton that's missing its head. This is Orladin himself. He turned his own body into lock and key, a final act of bored petulance with a hint of the macabre. Let's hear his confession. When I was told my sole duty in life was simply to wait, I ceased to live. That was my fate. I didn't need to be alive to do that. His gift for us is the ultimate light spell named after himself, except we haven't got the penultimate light spell flash, so we get that instead. Oh well. Beyond the wall, we find the spirit tree of Valad himself, essentially the god of this world. I'll show you the lore if you're interested. In Dark Souls, we know how the world was created. We have to uncover what happened afterwards, what went wrong. In Kingsfield, we know what went wrong, and we have to uncover how the world was created. Finally, the tree gives us some new drip. The armor of Icrius himself. Which is the best armor, boosts all our magic stats and various other buffs. Good. We've earned it. Now let's return to Kingsfield 1. Within the castle grounds themselves, waits the Royal Cemetery that self-same labyrinth in which Kingsfield 1 was set. You can always come here, no key required, and the game won't point you in this direction either. In my first playthrough a couple of years ago, I was blown away by the fan service. It is the beginning of Kingsfield 1, albeit a bit larger in dimension. It even has the very first wooden shield in the same secret room, which means canonically, Alfred never found this room. Unless he put the shield back, and the skeleton. It's not the entire of Kingsfield 1's first floor. Pathways have caved in, and we can't proceed. So it's the same area in a reduced manner, similar to Anolondo in Dark Souls 3. Even back then, this was part of the FromSoft playbook. And I love it. The merchant's still here. Old penny pincher Mr. Light. He's not allowed to die. Gyra's orders. I'm not really sure why. The portal to the second level has gone, but further delving reveals an old elven hero, Meryl Ur. Also undead, and just wandering a small room. We spew magic at each other, and his death reveals the way forward. Down, to the deepest level of the catacombs and the final area of KF1, which gives us a chaotic welcome. Across the ominous bridge, I'm finally reunited with the Stone Faces, my sometimes lover. This is where the fairy fossil comes in. Miria makes a brief reappearance, leading the way to what remains of Gyra, the final boss of Kingsfield 2.
He, or it, restores the Moonlight Sword to its former glory. It was made for one purpose, to kill one being. How Gyra's remains ended up down here after he was defeated on Melanet Island, you know, which is miles away, is beyond me. Come friends, it's time to end this. Back in Verdite Castle, we head upstairs. I go to run past the big knight again and think, hang on. Yeah, how'd you like that? Leveling light magic up since meeting Orladin has unlocked the final spell, Orladin. Yeah, it's pretty good. Interesting that the symbol appears to be the same as the national crest of Verdite. We should show the king. Well, looks like I used flash, actually. Oops. We do show him the Moonlight Sword restored, using the level 2 sword magic, something I've learned to do for the first time, this late in my third playthrough of the third game. Alfred falls quickly this time, but something's different. His spirit is freed. He bids us destroy the puppet master behind the scenes. Two dragons locked in a proxy war throughout history. Gyra was destroyed in the last game, now it's time for Seath to meet the same end. Seath, the white dragon who was worshipped by the High Elves, was created Henvalad. Henvalad? Ah, come on, man! These are some fireworks. Are we on the moon? I use a combination of Orladin and the Moonlight Sword magic. Seath also hits himself with his own spell. I think he finished himself off. I don't care if the story is generic. After spending so long on the game, this feels epic. But enough from me. I'll leave you with the game itself's voiceover. The Prince of Light had triumphed, and the destiny of a light had been fulfilled. A lone figure shone in the brilliant sun. Reposed in reverie, he seemed to be listening to something coming from the very light itself. Brightly does the fire of light burn within your heart, Austin Lyle Forrester. Long have I waited for such a line to be born as to quell the darkness born in the hearts of men and beasts alike. As long as your line may reign, you shall be known as the Golden Kings, and peace shall reign in your world. With the lesser paths of power coming into alliance, there's no longer need of me. I will finally return to Silvall. Your courage and vigilance has returned the light to your world. For this, I grant you back the life of your queen to be. The darkness enveloped Lin's body, but her spirit remained pure to the light. Peace, Golden King. Yo, we get a waifu back. That's not like you from Soft. The pure magic gameplay in this one felt torturous compared to the previous two games, but if you're going for the true ending, you get a massive spike of power right in the end game. Although I did make things harder for myself, for the sake of showing off the game, 
in my progression choices. I have a couple of ideas for old FromSoft goodness coming up. This brings the Verdite trilogy to an end. I might tackle Kingsfield 4 at some point in the future, but not now. Peace, Golden King! And we'll meet again someday soon.